few years ago, I was speaking with a brother in Christ, and he happened to remark about another person we knew. He said, you know, a lot of people love Christ. He's the only one I know that is in love with Christ. I'll never forget that. I wonder, would he say that about each one of us here today? Are we in love with Christ? Well, I can think of at least three people that I would say were in love with Christ. And they wrote about it. Thirty-two years ago, I read a short little book that had been translated from another language. It was written about 700 years ago by Ramon Lull. He was a Spanish missionary to the Muslims, and he wrote all sorts of scientific treatises to convince them that Christianity is true. His masterpiece, however, was a volume entitled Blanquerna, and it's sort of an allegory like Pilgrim's Progress, about himself, actually. And in the book, he has a a shorter book, a book within a book. And the book has the delightful little title, The Book of the Lover and the Beloved. And in that, uh, Lull is talking about Christ's love for him and his love for Christ. He is the lover and Christ is the beautiful beloved. I think he was in love with Christ. And then there was the great Samuel Rutherford, perhaps the greatest theologians that Scotland has ever produced. And in the 1600s, because of change in government, he was put out of his church and not allowed to preach. And so he was under a sort of house arrest in a small village elsewhere. And oh, how he missed his flock. Uh, So he would write letters back to them. And in the letters, he would counsel them and encourage them. And before long, in almost every one of the letters, he would take wings and, as it were, speak about the love of Jesus and his love for Jesus. It was almost like reading love letters. Someone later collected those letters and published them. And those books, that is still being published today. We have a copy in our library. And I encourage you to read a big old book, about 700 pages, The Letters of Samuel Rutherford. He was in love with Christ. Last year, I gave a little book to many of the ladies in the church here entitled In Love with Christ. It's the narrative of Sarah Edwards, the wife of Jonathan Edwards, my favorite theologian. And it's a short book that relates how she had loved Christ. Now she was in love with Christ. Sarah Edwards, Samuel Rutherford, Ramon Law. Many of the great hymns have to do with loving Christ and being in love with him. We'll sing a couple of them in a little while. Recently, I came across finally the words and music of a song that I had sung many, many years ago when I was an early Christian. And I never had the words, but I came across them. Maybe some of you all remember that old chorus. I keep falling in love with him over and over And over and over again. Today we close out our series on true biblical spirituality. 34 messages. And I've saved the best wine for last. The best part of our spiritual life is being in love with Jesus Christ. It's the most important part of the Christian life. Loving God. And specifically being in love with Christ. Take your Bibles and open for our first scripture reading to Matthew 22. A few years ago, I was leading a Bible study in another city. Mainly there's college students sitting around talking and asking questions. And I remember one young lady, about 20, asked a question and Very serious look on her face. It was slightly sad. 
she looked right at me and said, what does God really want from us? What does he want most from me? And I looked right at her and smiled and I said, my dear, what God wants most of all from you is for you to love him. She had never thought of that. Have you ever thought of it like that? The Jews had wondered, what was God's greatest commandment? What does he really want from us the most? Someone asked Jesus that question here in Matthew 22. And Jesus answered, perhaps with a smile. Verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. God wants us to love him. And we love God by loving Jesus, because Jesus is God. God's love comes to us through Jesus, and we return love back to God through Jesus. At Christ's baptism, God the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew Henry, the great Puritan, Bible scholars said, God's beloved should be our beloved as well. Another Puritan, Samuel Ainsley, said, This divine love is the unspeakable enlargement of the heart toward God. It is the ecstasy and ravishment of the heart in God. It is the soul's losing itself in God. It is the continual working of the heart Towards God. Beloved brethren, this is why God elected us, created us, and redeemed us, and will take us to heaven so that we would love Him. He would share His love so that we can give it back to Him. And unless you truly love God, you are not fulfilling the purpose of your very existence. This is why you are here. Without love to God, we're nothing. We're worthless. You know, we read the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, without love, I'm this, I'm that. And he says, I'm only a clanging symbol. And we usually apply that to our love to other people. Well and good. But it also applies to loving God. Unless we truly and sincerely love God, everything is nothing. Our prayers, our singing is noise before God. And Paul says, unless I love, I am nothing. No matter what we do as Christians, whatever our religious exercises, prayer, Bible study, witnessing, unless we love God, all of that is nothing. And unless you truly love God, you are nothing. You've got absolutely nothing. You've missed the main thing. It's not important. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. In other words, he's still under the wrath of God. He still has missed it all. Now, the unbeliever does not love the Lord Jesus Christ because he does not know him. And that's an evidence that he is not a true Christian. Even those that say they're Christians, they've been baptized, they go to church and so forth. But if they don't love Jesus, that's evidence they're not a true Christian. In John 8, 42, Jesus said to the Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me. They didn't love him. That was proof that they didn't have God as their father. They were still in their sins. So the unbeliever does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. He wastes his love on other things and other people, especially himself. It says over in 1 Timothy, they are characterized by being lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They waste their love. And they're blind to Christ's love and to his excellencies. That's why they don't love him, not just because of their sinful condition, but because they're blind. 
They do not see the excellency of the love of Jesus Christ. If they did, they would be irresistibly drawn to love him. To the unbeliever, I say, oh, that you would know Jesus and his love and would love him in return. That's why we offer Jesus to you. Come and believe in him. Repent of sins. Know his love flowing into your heart. And then love him in return. But an unbeliever might ask this question. Because all of this is a mystery to him. He might say, how can you love somebody that lived 2,000 years ago? He lived and died. Are you talking about just loving his memory like we love some great person in the past? No, no, that's not what I mean. We are able to personally love Jesus because he rose from the dead. He is alive today and he is God. Now, there's mystery in this. Being God, he's everywhere, invisibly. And when we become Christians, we are now able to have a personal, loving relationship with him that is more real than any other love relationship we have with our parents, our spouse, our children. Because they don't know everything about us, but Jesus does. And we know him because friends and loved ones may be with us. Jesus is actually in us. And we have the closest, most intimate relationship of all. And therefore, we can truly love him Deeper and better than any other. Nothing is more important in the life of a Christian, friends, than this. Nothing more important. Sadly, some Christians are bored with this. Now, you that have been in our church for many years know that every oh, year or two I like to preach on this theme. And it's going to sound like what I've said before. Sad to say in the past, when I've preached on this, I have actually seen people in the church... Yawn, and they get that look on their face like, here we go again, another love Jesus sermon. That breaks this pastor's heart. And I think, are your hearts as cold as ice that this subject does not touch you and warm you? Other Christians, sadly, they're not only bored with this, they make fun of this. I was in a preacher's gathering once. And you know how preachers are. They get to talking about their church and the Bible. And one of them happened to say, oh, yes, such and such. He's always talking about loving Jesus. And he said it in a disparaging way, kind of mocking it. I felt like saying, how dare you say that? You call yourself a preacher? You should be showing them what it means to be in love with Jesus. Fortunately, other Christians long for this. They sing the hymn, more love to thee. And they're grieved that they don't love Jesus enough. You see, there's a mystery in this. The more you do love him, the more you want to love him and are grieved that you don't love him enough. Ramon Lull, in his little book, said, I weep not only tears of love, but I weep that I don't love him enough. I weep that I don't weep more love for him. Do you long for a deeper relationship with God. If you're a Christian, you know God. Do you want to know Him deeper and deeper than you've ever known Him before? Or are you satisfied with where you are? And some Christians do want that deeper relationship. And so they try different means, some that are unbiblical, but other ones that are biblical. Some say, I'm going to study the Bible, and they, so they study it. And they read Greek and Hebrew and theology and church history. All of that is good, but it's not good enough. That is not the main means of knowing God deeper. Dear brethren, deeper knowledge of God comes through a holy love of Jesus Christ. Knowing Him deeper in love, the love of God coming through Jesus and loving Jesus and the love goes back to God. 
there remain infinite measures of personal knowledge of God that none of us have ever fully known. But we only know them in this way, by loving him. It's like, picture as it were, an enormously deep cavern. And you go down in there and you find out there are many different tunnels and unexplored caves. It's like that with knowing God deeper and deeper. And you go deeper and deeper and you go through those unexplored tunnels with the torch of love. Not just with a mind of theology, as good as that is, and you know that I'm a theologian. We need to use that knowledge of the Bible, as it were, to feed our love so that we go deeper in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. You will never truly know God any deeper than your love for him. And this, above all things, is the final test of your spirituality, your knowledge of God, and your character. What do you love the most? (coughs) A person? Maybe something that you own, a favorite gift or toy, something that you own. It should be the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody is more spiritual than his love for Jesus. Turn over to John 21. And here we read an uncomfortable conversation. Jesus is risen. He's done a miracle. Sitting around a little campfire on the seashore with a few of his disciples. And then after eating this fish and bread that he has provided, he turns to Simon Peter and says, Simon, do you love me more than these? Verse 15. And I imagine Peter was taken aback and said, well, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I'll love you. Now, you know that there's an interplay of different words in the original Greek. Jesus said, do you love me? And he used a word meaning deeply from the heart. And Peter said, well, yes, yeah, yeah, sure, Lord, I, I like you. He uses a lower word. I, I like you. You're my friend. You're my good friend. Jesus wasn't satisfied, so he probes a little deeper, like he probes our hearts and says, Simon, do you love me? And so Peter answers in the same way. And he asks him a third time. I think on this third time, Peter realized the Lord Jesus was probing. So he says, Peter was grieved because he says to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know my heart. Like Peter, we often give quick answers. Yeah, sure, I I like you, Lord. You're my buddy. That's not good enough. He doesn't want us to say that. He doesn't want us to say, I like you. He wants us to say, I love you. And Lord, you're not my buddy. You are the lover of my soul. You are the delight of everything in my deepest being. Lord, I love you. Listen to how Jesus asks you this question. And he will call out your name. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And you might say, well, sure. But he'll say, do you really love me? Or do you just say it? Do you just sing it when you sing these songs? My Jesus, I love thee. Do you really mean that? Or do you only think you love Jesus? Ephesians 6.24 says, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. That means they really do love him. So how do we develop this holy love for the Lord Jesus Christ? For our next scripture reading, turn to 1 John chapter 4. How do we develop this so that It would accurately be said of us that we are truly in love with Christ. Now, do we work it up with emotions? No, although it is deeply and spiritually emotional. God doesn't want unemotional love. He wants true love with feeling. But the secret is it must begin and end with Christ. He is the center of this love. 
Remember last week I said that true worship is reflected revelation. God reveals to us who he is and we reflect it back to him in the appropriate way. Same thing with love. True love for Jesus is simply reflected back to him the love he gives to us. We can't work it up by ourselves. You could say our love to him is an echo of his love for us. It's like God says, I love you. And he says that in scripture, such as Malachi 1. And we reply like David did in one of the Psalms. He says, I love you, O Lord. You could put it like this. The Lord says to us, I love you, I love you. And we reply, I love you too, Lord. I do love you. I love you too, Lord. Now look at 1 John 4. This is another great love chapter. Verse 19 says it all. We love him because he first loved us. That's the cause. That's the incentive. It begins with Jesus. He loves us. We return the love back to him. And it goes through various stages. One of them is grateful love. When we truly know that he loves us and has forgiven us all of our sins, we're grateful. And that produces a grateful love for him. I like that woman in Luke 7 that came to Jesus and Jesus was in the home of Simon, a Pharisee, and she comes, doesn't say anything, but what she did said it all. She comes and weeps on his feet, takes the hair and wipes the feet and dries it, and she pours on oil. Every tear was saying, I love you, I love you. Well, Simon didn't like all this, so Jesus said, well, Simon... There was a man, and he had two people owed him a lot of money, and he freely forgave both of them. One of them, he forgave an enormous amount, and the other one, it was a relatively small amount. Now, Simon, which of these two do you think loved the man the most? And Simon said, well, I guess it was the man that was forgiven the most. And Jesus said, that's right. And he looked at the woman and said, This woman whose sins are many has been forgiven much. Therefore, she loves much. And it was almost as if he said, Simon, do you love me like this woman? We should be like that woman and not like Simon. Which one are you like? The woman that was just overflowing with love. Or like cold-hearted Simon, who didn't realize. You say, well, if I'd been forgiven that much, I guess I would. We have all been forgiven more than we realize. And that's enough to imitate that woman. To love her. And let me ask you a question. I've asked it before. If the Lord Jesus walked into the service this morning, what would you do? Would you look at him from a distance and say, I've always wondered what he looked like? Or would you push and shove through the crowd and run as fast as you can and fall at his feet, longing to weep tears of love on his feet like that woman? Have you ever done that? Have you... Given love tears to Jesus in private. There's more. Here's how we can develop more love for Jesus. Turn back to the book of Romans now. Chapter 5. And again, as I've said week by week in this series, there are two interacting principles. Holy Scripture and Holy Spirit. God's means of giving love comes through Jesus and his ordained means is through the Holy Bible. It is not simply poetical language to say this is a collection of God's love letters to us. In it, we read about his display of love, his evidence, his explanation, his promises of love. And we should read it over and over again. Kind of like a woman that's married and tucked away somewhere, maybe in a bottom drawer somewhere, 
is a little packet of love letters that her husband sent to her when they were courting. You know, women will save these things and will tie it up with a little ribbon and then maybe sometimes she's lonely and she gets them out and reads them again and gets out her handkerchief and wipes away the love tears. Brethren, we should read the Word of God just like that. This is God's book of love letters. Read about it. The evidence, the proof, the explanation, it's filled with God's love for us. But it becomes a dead book without the Holy Spirit using it to, as it were, make it live in our hearts. And he injects the love of God in our hearts. Now look at Romans 5, 5, one amongst many verses on this. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. How does he do it? He uses Holy Scripture to fill us. And they keep filling us with the love of God. So when you find that love running low, get back into the word of God. The Holy Spirit actually helps us sense the love of God in us. We feel it. And then he helps us mysteriously love Jesus in return. So how do we go along with this? How do we cooperate? And again, the mysterious principle is faith. We love by faith. Turn now to 1 Peter chapter 1. We believe the Bible. We trust God's promises. For example, when we're in a situation, as I said a few weeks ago, when we don't feel God loves us, and if God loves us, why are we going through this? Hope and trust in God's promises of love. Faith is important to develop this love. Galatians 5, 6 says, Faith is works by love. Now, we're not saved by love. But we're not saved without love either. We're saved by faith. That's what helps justify us. But faith is not the end. It's Love is the goal and the best evidence of our faith. Recently at our home Bible study, we looked at James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. Faith without love is dead too. No love shows you have no faith. The goal of faith has helped to produce this love for the Lord Jesus. Look at 1 Peter 1.8. Whom, that's Jesus, having not seen, you love. How can you love someone you don't see? Because you know him. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. We love by faith. And there's more. Again, a few years ago, I was on an airplane somewhere, and I decided to witness to the young lady next to me. And found out she was a Christian, and we found out we actually knew one or two Christians in common in another state. And so we had a nice time talking, and the conversation got around to loving Jesus. And she said, I wish I could love him more. How can I really be in love with Jesus? And I said, well... Here's one way, but it's not a way that most people want. Physical affliction. Sometimes God sends physical affliction to Christians to help them love Jesus. She said, how? And I said, when we're really hurting, when we're sick, maybe even afraid. We cry out and the Lord Jesus will come and visit us. He'll comfort us like a loving mother for a sick child, and we know his love in a new way, and that is a golden opportunity for us to now fall in love with him and return that love. Many a Christian has fallen in love with Jesus in a hospital bed, on a sick bed at home, racked with pain, but they're filled with love. And she said, I'll have to think about that some more. And then there's another way that we develop this love relationship with Jesus. Jesus has given us communion. You say, how does that work? Well, you remember I preached on that a few weeks ago. Communion at communion. It's a meal. It's a love meal. You know, when a young couple are courting and going on a date, maybe that guy doesn't have much money, so he takes his date down to the local McDonald's and gets a value meal. Doesn't cost much. That's all he can afford. It doesn't matter. 
Because when they fall in love, they look at each other, it doesn't matter what they're eating. But a meal is an opportunity, and you know what I mean, where you eat together and you share a love. There's just something special about that. The Lord Jesus Christ has provided a love meal for us. And dear brethren, this meal, communion, is a foretaste of another meal we will have with him. It's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19 says that after the Lord Jesus returns, as it were, we will have the consummation of heavenly wedding with him. And there will be like a great wedding feast. Some of you remember back at your wedding. I remember when Matt and Kat were married. You remember the meal right afterwards. There was music and people were happy. We will one day be ultimately married to Jesus and enjoy a love feast with him. And he has provided a little foretaste of that here with bread and wine. And there's symbolism in that. Bible says that his love is like wine. Song of Solomon 1, 2 says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for his love is better than wine. And his love is better than bread because his love nourishes our souls. And we are all oh, that we would hunger and thirst for his love. And that when we are filled, we return it back to him. We love him. We need to cultivate that. So communion is a visible reminder of the greatest proof and evidence of God's love. This is indeed a love feast. It reminds us of his death. His death is the perfect final proof God loves us. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's what we should meditate upon at communion Every week, commune with Christ in love. Now, what's the nature of this love for Christ? It's just this. It's loving Christ. It's an all-encompassing obsession where all other thoughts are set aside. All other feelings, good or bad, are set aside. It's an all-engrossing obsession with him. Just like a couple that are in love and they can't take their eyes off each other. When we are in love with Christ, it's just that. It's in love with Christ. We are obsessed with Him. We want more of Him. All of our thoughts are on Him. Our holiest feelings, our very heart is on Him. That's what it means to be in love with Christ. We love him for what he did for us. And we thank him for dying for us and saving us from hell and forgiving us. But even more so, we love the Lord Jesus Christ because of the perfection of his person. And we dwell upon that and that delights us. We meditate upon him and we say, Lord, everything about you is perfect and beautiful. Your love, your mercy. Oh, I love your wisdom. Your power as we dwell upon him and meditate upon him personally, we fall deeper in love with him. Because everything about him draws love toward him. Again, the Song of Solomon says he is altogether lovely, meaning he is altogether, here's my word, he is love worthy. He is worthy of my love. It draws my love out toward him. He deserves it. And so love given to the Lord Jesus Christ is never wasted. We love him and everything about him. Not just his words or his works or his promises. We love him personally. Everything about him. We love Christ himself. Everything about him. A few years ago, there was a pop song. I don't even know the words of it or who sang it, but I like the title. All of me loves all of you. Can you say that to the Lord Jesus? Lord, everything in me, my mind, my heart, everything about me loves everything about you. And the more we truly love this Christ, the more we will want to love him. And yet here's where some more personal interplay comes in. 
the more we love him, the more we're humbled by the fact that we haven't loved him enough. Nobody has ever said, I love Christ perfectly. And the more we love him, we're humbled and ashamed by our low degree of love for him. This is what Ramon Lowe kept saying. He says, I weep because I have not wept enough before love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's similar to another spiritual principle. And that's this. The closer we get to God in his holiness, the light of his holiness shows more of the darkness of our sins. You know what that's like. The closer you get to him, the more repentant you are. It's like that, too. The more we know of his love, the more we know how little we do love him. And yet it increases our love for him. Grow in that love. Remove any hindrances to his love. Let it mature. Just like a couple that's been married 20, 30, 40 years. Laura Catherwood's parents are celebrating this weekend 60 years of being married. You ever seen a couple like that been married a long time? They have a mature love. It's like aged fine wine. And they're more in love now than they were at the beginning. That's the way it should be for Christians. We should grow in love. Sadly, too often, oh, we love them when we're first saved. Young love. And then we grow out of that and our love grows cold. Or as it says in the Bible, you've lost your first love. Brethren, we should go on and grow in this love and let it mature and get deeper. 1 John 4.19 is again a principle there. We love him because he first loved us. And that again reminds us he loved us. First, when we were in our sins, he even loved us before we were created. He loved us in eternity and chose us out of love. But knowing that he first loved us moves us to love him. I read a story about a little girl that illustrates this. The mother had to write a letter, so she said, now you go in the other room and play with your dolls. And then when I'm finished, you can come on in here. Well, the little girl went over there and was playing with the dolls and Then the mother said, well, come on back. I finally finished the letter. And the little girl comes running and jumps up in mommy's arms and hugs and says, oh, mommy, I I love you. I love you. And the mother says, well, you you say you love me, but I hear you say to your dolls, you love them. Do you love me like you love your dolls? Oh, no, mommy, they can't love me back. You children remember that. You girls have a little doll. You boys have toys. You say, I love them. They can't love you back. They're not people. It takes a person to love you. So the little girl says, well, mommy, I love you because you love me. And then then the little girl said something deep. Little children can say the deepest thing. She said, mommy, I don't just love you because you love me, but you loved me before I was able to love you. When I was just a little baby. And the mother whispered, we love him because he first loved us. Do you know what that means? When you were still in your sins, the Lord Jesus loved you. And with that love went to the cross and suffered and died for you. And even in your life before you believed in him. When you ignored him, you told jokes about him, you ignored him. He loved you and chased you down and sent his spirit to bring you to him. And he overwhelmed your resistance. And in a way, you could say he made you love him. And you say, thank you, Lord. You love me enough to do that. That's part of this mystery of how we. Learn to love him. Now, here's another one I would share with you. Let's see it from Christ's perspective, not just from ours. He loves us. Has it ever occurred to you how he longed to give you that love before you loved him, when you were in rebellion and there was nothing, absolutely nothing in you that was lovely? Everything in you deserved the wrath of God. This shows the wonderful nature of his first love for you from his perspective. 
He actually desires to give us his love and he earnestly desires to have your love back to him. And as Christians, hear me closely, this is very important. He longs for us to love him. The mystery is he doesn't need it, but he yearns for it and he's pleased with it. He delights with it to have us love him in return. He really and truly delights in our love more than we ever delight in his love because he has a greater capacity. We love it when, oh, Lord, you love me. Has it ever occurred to you that when you love him back, that pleases him? That's part of being in love with the person and the love is going back and forth. He delights in it. Let me give you a little illustration. A long time ago, I watched an old movie. I think it was from the early 50s. It was called Marky. And in the movie, a big tough man, I think he played the butcher. He was lonely, middle-aged, said, I've never been in love. And I want to love. He's played by Ernest Borgnine. You remember him? Big old muscular guy, about as handsome as a turtle. And he was he won an Oscar for the movie. And he's saying, I want to love. And he finally met this woman that was plain, but he fell in love with her. And he wanted, is she going to love me? And the moment came when he worked up his courage and he said, I love you. And very sheepishly, she said, Marty, I love you too. And the reaction of Marty, he was so excited and she gets on the bus, and he's so excited, he goes jumping down the street, he goes up to her side and punches it, and he says, she loves me, she loves me. He was delighted. He had given love and received it back. The Lord Jesus Christ is thrilled with a heavenly joy when we love him back. And he shares that joy with us. It's a joyful thing to be in love with Jesus. And it's a romantic thing. We sing Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Let me share a little bit more about this. The Bible frequently says that we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some Christians misunderstand that. Because unfortunately in the history of the world, slavery has been a very mean and cruel thing. Jesus is our master, but he is not a cruel master He is a loving master. Now, here's the principle. Exodus 21, during the time of the Jewish theocracy, the Jews could have slaves. They would have to be freed on the Jubilee year. But it says that perhaps there would be a slave that loved his master. And when the time came for him to be freed, and the master would say, you're free, you can go. And the slave says, I don't want to go. And it says, If that slave says, I love my master, I don't want to be free, I want to stay with him. Then the law of Moses said you took the slave over to a door, he took his earlobe and put it up against the wood, and he took a nail and drove it through it. Steve, talk about ear piercing. Wow. And he drove it in and pulled it out, and that little mark would be like a a tattoo saying, You love your master and you will serve him out of love forever. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ wants from us where we say, I belong to him. He loves me too much to let me go and I love him so much. I would never let go of him, brethren. We are love slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's got us in the bonds of love. It's a mutual love, as I say. That's the secret. He loves us. We love him. And we're in love with him. Now, again, this is misunderstood. Sometimes uh, a person will think, well, it's like loving someone that doesn't love you back. Illustration of this is maybe there'll be a teenage girl that looks at a picture of some famous singer or maybe a boy in another class in school and says, oh, I love him. I love him. She loves the picture. She doesn't even know the person. And that person doesn't love her back. That's a false kind of love. It's maybe an attempt. You know what true love is? Is when you're not having the picture, you have the person. 
and the person says, I do love you and you love him. That's what it means to be in love is where it goes back and forth, heart to heart, mutually. We're in love with Christ who loves us. It's a deep, personal, intimate love, more than any mere human love. We're in love with one another. And he has perfect, faithful love for us. Unlike all human love, it is greater than any love that we have here on earth. But it is a different kind of love, just like you love your spouse differently than your children. You love your ch- children different than the family dog. And you love the family dog better than anything else. You see, there are different gradations. We love Jesus in a unique way because he has a unique love for us. It's qualitatively different. It is unique and therefore our love for him must be unique. He must have first place in our heart's affections. Not second, not third. He's greedy. He demands first place. In fact, Jesus even said this. Whoever loves father or mother, husband or wife, more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus said to Peter there in John 21, Peter, do you love me more than these? We are to love Jesus first, last, always, most and best. Now, again, it's not entirely like falling in love with just another person. For no other person is exactly like Jesus. Nobody loves us like Jesus. And sometimes we will fall in love recklessly. So when we hear the term, well, you fall in love, that's like a person, not just teenagers, but a person will fall in love. And before you know it, they fall out of love. This love is not like that. Once we are truly in love with Jesus, we will be in love. Now, sometimes it's not always as fervent, but it is unique because we're in love with Jesus who truly loves us and will keep us in love. Now, all love desires to express itself. Love songs, flowers, poetry on Valentine's Day. How do you express your love for the Lord Jesus? Now, of course, we do it in obedience, we sing, we worship, and things like that. But have you ever tried a new way, a special way? Do you ever sing love songs to Jesus when you're by yourself? He loves to hear that. Now, you say, well, I can't sing very well. That doesn't doesn't bother him. Just the fact that you sing to him will be a pleasing song in his ears. You know, it's like a couple, maybe they're dating, maybe they're married, and, you know, the guy says, I'm going to send a text to her. Pushes out some little love note to her. Or maybe he'll be like my father. My father and mother, they loved each other to the day that he died. And he would phone her from work every day and they'd talk about things. And he would always say, I love you, sweetheart. And that thrilled her heart. Maybe it's something like this. A man loves his wife and says, I'm going to surprise her. So he phones her up at work when she's not expecting. And he says, you know, I've just been thinking about you. As I think about you, you know, lovely little thoughts go dancing across my mind and they warm my heart. And I just had to phone and say, I love you. Totally unexpected. Maybe she does something like that. In the morning, you know, he's in their room shaving. And so she packs his little sack of lunch, puts a little sandwich, maybe an orange, maybe a piece of candy or a cookie. And then she writes a little note saying, I just want to surprise you and say I've got the best husband in the world and I love you with all my heart. Sticks it in there. How do you think he feels when he gets that? What am I saying? We should, as it were, think of ways day by day to express our love to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just Sunday morning, but other times when we think about him. Take a few minutes, maybe when you're driving in the car. Or how about this? You're waiting in the waiting room to see your doctor. And maybe one of you ladies, you're sitting there and you're just thinking about Jesus and a smile comes across your face. and You just start humming a little hymn. And the lady next to you says, what are you, what, what, what are you thinking about? And you, you say, oh, I'm in love. And now that lady's going to say, oh, tell me about it, honey. I want to hear about this. And you say, I'm in love with the most perfect man in the world. He loves me. Oh, he's the kindest person. Oh, he's so wonderful. He loves me and I love him. And she says, well, who is he? And you smile and say, Jesus, can I tell you about his love? 
We should think about Jesus and express our love to him anywhere. Everywhere. Samuel Rutherford said that this produces love smiles for him. True joy, true ecstasy, an intense love, a passionate love, a veritable flame of holy love for him. His love for us and our love for him increasing back and forth. There's more. A couple that are in love, they not only like to have a meal together, they want to be alone and express that love without anybody present. When we're in love with Jesus, we cherish secrecy with him, solitude with just the Lord Jesus, where we speak to him and then his word comes alive in our hearts and we're alone with the Lord Jesus Christ. Samuel Rutherford put it like this. He said, I wish I had a thousand hearts and I would give them all to Jesus in love. It's like John Wesley's song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, Oh, that we had a thousand hearts to love them with. Now, this love will change our demeanor, our life, our affections. It produces a holier life in us. This is the engine of biblical spirituality. It helps us love him. Again, another illustration. Father and mother at the end of the day are sitting there and she's sewing on a button and he's reading the evening paper. And she says, honey, I'm worried about Tommy. Tommy's her teenage son. Well, what's wrong? He's not acting right. Something strange happened. Well, what do you mean? Maybe I ought to have a talk with him. What's going on? You know, whenever he goes out at night, he he puts on a clean shirt. He doesn't do that. He's brushing his teeth three times a day. He's even changing his socks without me asking him to do it. Husband says, oh, I can tell you what it is. He's in love. And she says, what? How do you know? Puts the newspaper down and says, well, that's how I acted when I fell in love with you. (laughs) What's that? Tommy is falling in love and wants to make himself presentable. You see where I'm going with this? When we're in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to live holier lives that are pleasing to him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I could go on and on. We long to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, most of all in heaven. When we are in love with him, we can look at death in a completely different way. We say, I long to see him, to be with him in heaven. And then the day will come. When they'll lay our dead body in a coffin and people will walk by it. I hope that they will say of each one of us, there goes someone that was in love with Jesus. And the body will be there, but our souls will be with him. We will be with the one We have been in love with all those years. Oh, family of God. And then we will begin to spend all eternity in love with Jesus. Receiving more of his love, loving him perfectly in return. Forever. That's the best thing about heaven and being in love. With Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your love through Jesus. Thank you for the wonderful privilege of loving Jesus. Lord Jesus, we want to tell you we love you. And now we want to sing it to you and sit at your table. Fill us with love. And we love you too. In Jesus' name, amen.